Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you for coming. My name is Amy Draves, and I'm here to welcome Carolyn Arnold to the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Carolyn's here to discuss her book, Small Move, Big Change, Using Micro-Resolutions to Transform Your Life Permanently. She has designed a system involving small, pivotal behavioral changes that will lead to true personal transformation. She's been a technology leader on Wall Street for more than a decade and is a managing director at a leading investment banking firm. She led the team at Morgan Stanley that was awarded the Wall Street and Technology Award for creating the Google IPO auction platform. Please join me in giving her a very warm welcome. Thank you, really. Thank you all for coming. It's great to be here. <clears throat> it's a special pleasure for me to be at Microsoft because I am a tech person and I grew up programming on Visual Basic. Um, Visual C++, .NET, um, still important technology to me today. Um, in addition to uh, programming languages, the Office Suite is still a lar figures largely in a lot of the innovative things we do. Um, as Amy mentioned, my team built the auction platform for the Google IPO, which was a very unusual transaction. I don't know how many people remember, but sort of everyone, anyone in the United States was allowed to sort of bid on Google stock, and we only had like six weeks to build a system that would gather all of these bids across Wall Street and process them. And so almost immediately we hit on the idea that we would be um, passing Excel files back and forth between these uh, brokerage firms and ourselves. So uh, that's all it. And this is my first book. Uh, it's my first book tour. It's my first time in Seattle. It's not my first time on a Microsoft stage. Because in 2003, um, I was invited for the 2003 launch of Office to um, appear with Steve Ballmer in Orlando. And um, my handlers, who got me ready and told me what to expect, um, said, now, uh, you know, when you go out there, Steve will ask you some questions. If he doesn't like you, like if you're bombing, he'll just thank you for coming. <laughs> and, you know, even if you haven't finished, that's your cue to leave. So just <laughs> go and, you know, uh, sort of like the bomber hook, you know. And I went out there, and it was kind of like being shot from a cannon. You know, there were all these blaring lights and everything. And, and I thought we were talking about it, but it seemed to go by for me, like in a second. So when I exited, I thought, you know, well, how did it go? And they said, oh, my God, that was just like a home run. He kept you two minutes over. And like that two minutes was considered, you know, uh, you know, Steve's time, being critical as it is, uh, was considered a sign of success. So um, I have a little bit longer today. And I just, you know, if I'm looking, wondering, may, is he going to appear and thank me for, for coming <laughs> halfway through the thing? That, that would be bad. Um, so um, it is the new year, and this book is about change. It's a time of change. Can I just ask for a show of hands for how many people made a New Year's resolution? OK. Um, how many people uh, have kept their New Year's resolution so far? OK, a little fewer. How many people uh, can remember their New Year's resolution from last year? How many people succeeded at their New Year's resolution last year? OK, um, you know, 90% of people fail at their New Year's resolutions, whether you're a high achiever or not. Um, and it's, uh, it's the punchline uh, this time of year on late night talk shows and stuff. It's such a common thing to fail at your New Year's resolution. Um, organizer shops and fitness programs and diets and even books like mine do their best business during January, because that's the time we kind of try to shake ourselves out of the holiday doldrums and, and do something. But very few of us succeed. It's, it's a rare event to succeed at a New Year's resolution. And I think a very common thing when you fail at your New Year's resolution is to blame yourself. I think you know, it's kind of a common thing to say, I just, I just wasn't strong enough. Why am I so weak? You know, why can't I succeed at this? I succeed at other things. But in fact, it isn't weakness. It's not a character flaw. Um, it's neurological. Uh, willpower is a neurological resource. And it actually shares a pool. It's part of a pool of neurological resources 
mental energy activities. One is willpower. One is active initiative, you know, taking charge of things. One's decision making and problem solving. They all share sort of the same pool. And willpower can be, is, it's depleted over time. And if you stress your willpower too much, it just runs out. But because it also shares the same mental space with these other really important brain activities, other things can deplete your willpower. So if you have to make a lot of decisions during the day at your job, it's taking away from that willpower space. Anything you have to kind of negotiate yourself or get yourself up for, using the same mental energy as that willpower space. So that's uh, a lot of why people fail. And um, there is a way to sort of rethink these resolutions so that you can be more successful. So coming back, fundamentally, coming back to you, the resolutions that we make, um, I'm going to read some resolutions. And uh, you tell me, you know, raise your hand if you've ever made anyone like this before. Anyone ever made the one to be fit? You know, go to the gym, go running. OK, a lot of people. How about to be slim by summer? That one. OK. Um, be organized? Be on time? Uh, get more sleep? OK, good, because sleep's important. We'll talk about that more. How about to be more assertive? Be, more defen be less defensive. Improve a relationship. OK. If you listen to the language of, you know, and be neat, if you listen to the language of those resolutions, they're a lot about being, to be something different. Really, they're closer to wishes than they are to resolutions for action. When you're a slob and you resolve to be neat, you're just wishing to be a different person, to like drop all the habits and the behaviors. If you make a, a, a resolution to be organized, you're pretty much just going to, every time you touch a piece of paper all day, be organized, you know? Be organized. Uh, open a kitchen drawer. Be organized. Be organized. Be organized. And pretty soon, you've exhausted your will to change. I mean, you're really putting yourself in a space where your number one activity is telling yourself to be different in another way. And that is uh, a large part of why it is stressful to make a New Year's resolution. So. The way that we actually are able to preserve this mental energy we have is that mostly you're running on a kind of personal autopilot all day long. Um, it's the mass of behaviors and attitudes and preferences and habits that you've learned through your whole life. Um, it's mindless and it's efficient autopilot. It doesn't cost you any willpower or real mental activity. You don't have to concentrate to tie your shoes, right? Autopilot ties your shoes. Autopilot locks the door. If you grew up making your bed, autopilot makes your bed for you. You know, you turn around and make your bed, and oh my God, my bed is made. You know, the stealthy, <laughs> stealthy hand of autopilot did it for you. You didn't even realize it's so mindless for you. But if you didn't grow up making your bed and you decide you're going to make your bed, it will cost you. It will cost you because it's not part of autopilot. Autopilot does a lot of good things for us because it allows us to kind of, it has a low, efficient hum of running your day. But autopilot is also the thing that snags the last donut by the coffee machine. You know? It's the thing that snaps at your partner when there's a certain kind of dynamic. It's the thing that causes you to skip the gym. If you don't usually go and you make a resolution to go to the gym, if it hasn't been part of your autopilot, you'll feel tremendous resistance. Autopilot is about resisting change because that's what makes it efficient. It pushes back on change because routine is its thing. So when you make a resolution to be organized, you are really declaring war on autopilot because you're going to have to be conscious about every single thing you do all day to be organized. And that's what depletes your willpower so quickly. Between autopilot and that mass of sort of ingrained behaviors and attitudes and stuff, uh, willpower is the loser. Autopilot is the winner, generally. Now, some people say, oh, but I've known people who have had these they transform themselves overnight. And that can happen. It's just a very rare event. And often, it's attached to something negative. You know, if you get a bad health report, or you get a bad review on the job that says that you're disorganized, you might clean up your desk overnight and be really on to that. And it's going to dominate your life. Or you know, if, you're, if, 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 if you fall out of a relationship. I've seen people fall out of a relationship, and all of a sudden, they're at the gym, and they're eating less, and things like that. But mostly, you don't want to be driven by that thing. Uh, uh, Alec Baldwin, who 
was very thin in his 20s, and then he gained a lot of weight and, uh, you know, sort of ended up being the heavy in films, got a, uh, just this past year was told he was becoming diabetic, and in three months he gave up sugar and lost 40 pounds. And he could have lost that 40 pounds any time. It would have been probably healthy for his career, but he didn't because it kind of got tied to something uh, dire. So you don't want to only change or be able to change when you get that kind of, uh, be put in that kind of situation. You want to really be able to change all the time. Um, the thing about New Year's resolutions and the failure thing we get in, we make a big push and then we make some progress, you lose some pounds or something, and then it sort of withers, right, and it goes. And you think, God, you know, it just wasn't, if you don't think that you're weak, you think it's because it was the wrong time. It's such a stressful time. In three months, I'll be able to do it. And you get into this kind of stopping and starting and stopping and starting without making any progress. And the book um, that I'm here to talk about today, Small Move, Big Change, is about continuous self-improvement. You just redesigning your behaviors one at a time. It's about the transforming power of the marginal behavioral change. That marginal behavioral changes that you can sustain forever can transform you, your personal life and your professional life. Um, okay, so how did this, I get into this? I mean, uh, how did I come to be here talking about this book? I, I came because uh, I myself was a, I, a resolution breaker. So several years ago, I had broken my resolution four years in a row. Um, when my resolution was to lose weight and exercise more. Lose weight and exercise more. And uh, I had broken it every year, and I couldn't understand it. I mean, these failures were a mystery to me. I mean, how is it possible that I could move a mountain at work uh, and do pretty well for my family, but the one thing that I wanted to do to change myself, I was a bust at every year. And I thought, well, it must be that I'm picking the wrong resolution. It's just so hard to eat less and exercise more. I'm going to pick something easy, because this year I'm going to succeed. So the easy resolution that I picked for myself that year was to be organized, the one we were talking about before. And I went out and I got all the desk organizers, the cubby holes and the slots. I color coded all my files. I put everything away. And when I stood back and surveyed my desk, I congratulated myself on having succeeded at my New Year's resolution. And three months later, my desk looked as crappy as it had before I bought all the organizers because I really I had a burst of sort of organizational zeal, right, I, to, to get, get over this hump. But I didn't really have any behaviors to sustain it. But on this year, because I thought that was going to be my easy resolution, I was so mortified to have failed at what I thought was going to be my easy resolution that I just wouldn't concede defeat. And I thought, OK, well, if I can't be organized, what is one thing I can do that would be, make me more organized. And I looked through all the ways in which I was disorganized. I sort of reverse engineered my behavior, for those of you who are programmers. And I had many options to choose from in being disorganized. But I just picked one. And the one I picked was to put all my notes in one notebook. Um, I had a habit of taking notes on whatever was handy and in front of me. So if I was in a meeting and there was an agenda, I'd take my notes there. Uh, by the phone, if there was like a loose pad, I'd take my notes there. At home, I might put something on the back of an envelope. And then when I wanted to find something, I'd have pieces of paper on my desk at home, pieces of paper on my desk at work, pieces of paper in my handbag. And I thought, I'm going to put all my notes in one place. And I went out and got like a little shiny red notebook. I still have it with me. And I thought, this is going to be a breeze. And the revelation was, is it was really hard just to do that one thing. I hated doing it. I hated taking notes in the book. I felt awkward, it felt weird. If I was sitting in a meeting and I was talking to you and we're doing something, I want to make a note, I thought, oh, I have to fish into my handbag, find this notebook, find a page and do it. If I were on the phone and I just wanted to jot down a confirmation number or something and I'd see my book over there, I had to go get my book and do it. If somebody stopped me in the halls at work and told me something I needed to know, I thought, well, won't I just remember it? I had to do it. But because it was such a reasonable re resolution, I just felt I had to do it. Because if I didn't do it, I would have to sort of face I was never going to improve at anything. It was so obvious that I could do it, that it was feasible and limited. So I stuck with it. 
And I'm only going to read one thing today, but I will just read this one section about this short. OK, I stuck with it. I forced myself to put all my notes in my little red book. If I had an idea for a client, I wrote it in the book. Confirmation numbers, in the book. Recommended articles, websites, events, in the book. Random contacts I might never need again, in the book. Packing list, in the book. Priorities and to-do lists, in the book. Bullet points for my next presentation, in the book. Recipe from a friend, in the book. After weeks of reminding myself to use the notebook, I noticed my feelings of resistance and awkwardness fading as the notebook became second nature. I just did it without thinking, like brushing my teeth. As soon as I sat down in a meeting or at my desk, I reached for the notebook. Now I could locate what I needed almost immediately, without stress or drama. Notes I would have once deemed throwaways proved significant weeks on. The notebook rule that I had first found intrusive and constraining, I now experienced as empowering and liberating. My stress level declined. I had become more organized. Um, and that was sort of my first sort of epiphany, if you will, about how change happens. That it's something very targeted, that it fills a specific need, that it gives you a benefit, that it's something you can sustain. And I decided to try diet. I thought, OK, I did the notebook. Could I apply the same rule to eating? And I looked through all the things I did uh, with respect to my eating habits. And I picked one thing. I decided never to eat a conference room cookie again. Um, I worked in a firm where there were really rich cookies and afternoon meetings. Sometimes I would eat one. Sometimes I would eat two. There were probably about 400 calories each. Sometimes I would eat three. And I would leave these meetings kind of sick and kind of in the food coma space, right? And then I would crash like an hour later. And I just thought, I'm never going to eat one of these again. I'll bring my own cookie. I didn't say I would never eat a cookie again, because right, that's in the failure space. I didn't say I would never eat in a conference room again. That wouldn't have worked either. I just said I'm never going to eat one of those cookies again. And I didn't. And I sort of arrested the long-term upward climb of my weight. And so what I ended up doing was spending time on this stuff and really practicing this. This was my year of behaving differently, where I actually behaved differently. And I did a couple of these things the whole year, uh, throughout the year. And then friends of mine began doing it, and colleagues began doing it. And they sort of began giving me their stories. And that became the basis for this book and the set of rules that, that, that sort of developed around this. But the major thing that I discovered during this year was real change happens at the margin. It happens at the margin of behavior, what you might all, almost call the vital margin. Um, you know, people don't wake up 15 pounds overweight or many thousands of dollars in debt. It is something that happens at the margin. And a change in eating habits can have one eating habit, can have a big effect. A change in spending pattern can cause you to save more money. These are all the positive things. A subtle change in communication can help you in a relationship. A, a slight change in attitude can help you advance on the job. And to prove this to yourself, you only need to see the reverse of that is true. That relationships get sour on the corners and at the edges. It isn't an overnight thing. That you know people end up uh, going into debt over time by small, small behaviors. And when you realize that and realize the linchpin of that was to work the margin, I started making a lot of progress. Um, and that each one of these micro resolutions sort of advanced the ball, and I began to develop uh, differently. Um, so I think one way to think about this as technologists that might be useful, especially at Microsoft, is you know, we live in the age of the small and the powerful. You know, microcomputer chips, iPods, iPads, nanotechnology is revolutionizing medicine. You know, uh, microfinancing is eliminating poverty. Uh, you know, critical communications come in 140 character tweets. You know, each one of these tools is a very sort of precise dart aimed at a precise target, filling a certain need and delivering a benefit immediately. And that's kind of the idea behind the micro resolution. Um, 
So, like how to start. Um, you know, we can try some today, and I'll sort of go through some of the principles, and the way the book works is the first part of it is sort of the seven rules for making micro-resolutions, and then the second half is broken up into the most popular areas of kind of self-improvement with a lot of stories and models. There's a lot of science in the book if you're interested in that, willpower science, et cetera. Um, but the first rule of making a micro-resolution is a micro-resolution is easy, okay? Everybody has to like that. It's easy. Don't make resolutions you can't keep. Make a resolution you're absolutely sure you can succeed at. And don't tell yourself it's too small to be significant. Say, what is it that I can do that I can succeed? To be sure that you can succeed and no excuses resolution, it's got to be limited. You know, to say I'm going to walk everywhere all the time, or I'm going to give up sweets, or I'm not going to online shopping, that's not limited. Limited, something absolutely targeted. It's got to be reasonable something that you think you can absolutely follow through with, okay? It's not um, uh, relative, you know, like uh, uh, to snack more or to snack less or exercise more. It's got to be in sort of the absolute space. So when you're going to start, start in an area like let's say it's neatness and reverse engineer your behavior. Look at all the things that you say if you want to be neat, Forget about being neat. What are you going to do differently today that makes you neater? It could be as simple if you're a total slob as just closing all the drawers after you've opened them or closing closet doors. It could be segregating surfaces so that you know you don't end up with your hairbrush on your desk and coins and keys in your bathroom. You could be as simple as that. Or it could be more ambitious to do your dishes immediately after dinner, whatever it is. But it's going to be based on you and your behavior. Um, if we take to be fit, a lot of people say, okay, well, I'm going to go to the gym three times a week. Also very vague, right? What are those three days? Okay, you don't know. First of all, it's probably too much. If you don't go to the gym today and you don't have the habit, your autopilot's going to find a reason for you not to go a couple of those days. But this gets to a very important principle. If you overreach, all you do all week is bargain with yourself. You say, oh, you know, I didn't go today, but I'll go tomorrow, you know. Oh, I didn't go Wednesday, but I'll make it up on Saturday or Sunday. And that kind of bargaining is decision making. Decision making depletes willpower. The more you have to think about it, the more you have to discuss it with yourself, the less likely you're going to succeed at it. So you want to be absolutely explicit. So if you say, okay, I'm going to, it could be, I'm going to walk to work or one day a week. I don't do it now, I'm going to walk to work one day a week. If you're in a driving city, it could be I'm going to drive in the furthest parking lot at Microsoft and I'm going to walk to my building and walk back. Whatever it is the thing you think you absolutely can do. You know, so much science now is also about, uh, when I started researching the book, also about uh, what happens at the margin. It turns out in fitness, um, I think maybe some of you have read of how bad it is to be sedentary, to sit all day. It's kind of like the new smoking. They say it is better, it, you get a better health benefit of getting up two times an hour to walk around for a couple of minutes than you do to go to the gym for an hour after work. That is a better health boost than the hour after work. There's so many things like that that boost your health uh, since we're talking about fitness. Standing, if you take a bus or train, just not gonna stand every day. You're not gonna wanna stand every day. You wanna stand maybe one way in. And after a while, you may prefer standing. But whatever you do that's different, I'm going to tell you this, you're not going to like it. It is really disturbing to your autopilot. It feels weird and awkward, and you have to have enough willpower to push past that time where it just feels icky to the time where it actually supports you and goes into autopilot, and you don't need any willpower to sustain it, which is really the definition of getting something into willpower. Um, that business of arguing with yourself and deciding it actually has a name in science. It's called decision fatigue, decision fatigue. You see that a lot, too, in people's diets. They say, OK, I'm going to cut 100 calories out a, out a day. OK, if you don't say what 100 calories you're going to cut, you're going to be counting and adding and figuring it out all day long. That's decision fatigue. You want to get these things in a space where you don't have to think about them. You want them to be mindless. Um, one thing I found out is there's no such thing as a small change. They're all significant. The ones I've made, practically and personally and psychological, psychologically, 
Um, but you get something, you know, something that seems limited has a lot of benefits. So if you walk to work one day a week, which was where I started, and now I walk to work five days a week and do Pilates three times a week, but I started walking once a week, you're going to be fitter, you're going to arrive at work at a clearer head, you're going to have, going to see every season of the year, for good or for bad, which has its own effect. You may sleep better, you may think better at work, all these things from doing one thing differently. One thing differently. Okay. So that's one kind of micro resolution. Another one is, you know, your head is a lot to do with who you are and how you react to things, your attitudes and your values. You can do something called a micro resolution message, which is not a commitment to act or behave in a certain way, but just to send yourself a message on a cue. So, for example, um, you might send yourself the message when you come home with your coat, if you're working on neat. It's really just as fast to hang it up before you drop in chair. No commitment to hang it up. It's really just as fast to hang it up. Um, if you're tempted to snack, instead of telling yourself no snacking, you could work on a mindset thing, which is just, I really enjoy dinner so much more when I'm hungry for it. I really enjoy dinner more when I'm hungry for it. That was one of mine. So it wasn't that I didn't snack, but I started shifting the way I snacked so I'd be hungry for my meal. And these things work on you and they'll change the way that you behave. If you're tempted to spend on something and you overspend, when you're looking at something that maybe you shouldn't really, really can't afford to buy, you can send yourself the message, um, the greatest luxury is security. The greatest luxury is security. It's personal. All these are personal. You have to kind of find the dart that hits your psychological spot and has a difference. But it will affect your head and it will affect the way you behave. And um, maybe we'll talk about some other ones that people have done that have been very good. OK. Freud said, thought is father to the deed. So that's kind of the idea there. OK. The next rule. So first one is it's easy. The second thing is it's an action, an explicit and measurable action. Um, as I said, it's absolute, not relative. It's not doing something more or doing something less. It's absolutely specific to that. It's not something in the aggregate, like I will have done this three times a week, or I'm going to do this five times a month. If you're going to do something once a week, you have a day and a time that you're going to do it. And you only measure yourself on that. So if I say I'm going to walk to work, I'm going to walk to work on Monday morning, that's it. That's what I'm measuring myself on. OK, it could be snowing, so I don't go. It didn't do, happen that week. But, and I can walk more if I feel like it. But the only thing I'm going to measure my, my resolution on is did I walk on Monday morning? And that relieves all of this kind of negotiating and everything else. And one of the magic about being so explicit is that you want to manage obstacles out of your way because this is your only chance. You're not going to defer it, right? You're going to say, this is it. I'm going to do my resolution. And if I don't do it, I can't make it up. So you want to be absolutely explicit about what you do. I think I brought up the 100 calorie example. That's just a math problem you have to solve all day, 100 calories. You won't know till the end of the day, did I save 100 calories? You don't want to be in that place. If you say you're not going to eat bread at dinner, that's 100 calories, and you do that. If you drink two glasses of wine and you drink a glass and a quarter, that's 100 calories. If you say, I eat a candy bar at 3 o'clock every day or a cookie, I'm going to eat half of it, that's 100 calories. That's the space you want to be in, mindless. You want to think mindless so that it can just slip in and become part of your uh, autopilot. It's personal. I think we spoke about that. Uh, it's a reverse engineering thing. You have to look at your own habits. So something that makes you late isn't the thing that makes me late. If you drive, being out of gas can make you late. If you commute with a card, being out of fares can make you late. Um, I was late in the morning, and I wanted to reverse that. There were 100 reasons that I was late. I picked one. The thing that bothered me the most is when it was time to leave. I live in Brooklyn. I commute into the city. I take my young daughter to school, and then I go on to work is that nagging feeling, were my keys where they were supposed to be, or were they in a coat pocket or on my bureau? Did I really have enough money left on my Metro card to just slide through the thing, or was it going to say insufficient fare as I heard the train like rumbling by? Um, what about cash, because I need a little bit of cash for a car ride with my daughter? And all morning, that sort of hung over me, that sense of, were all those things there? And I finally just got a separate purse 
And every Friday night, I filled up my Metro card and put it in this purse. I got money on the way home on Friday night, enough for every car ride. I put it in the purse and I put an extra key in there. And I did not use that purse for anything else. If I had to commute someplace else, I had a separate card. So there was no way I could lose track of how many fares there were. If I ran out of money in my regular wallet, I went and got money at the cash machine, but I didn't deplete that wallet. And I haven't been late for that reason since I did it. There are other ways to be late. I'm working on those. But I have not been late for that. So you have to sort of take a look at your own behavior. Eating, so personal. Everybody picks up the same diet. It's really personal. Some people are snackers. Some people skip breakfast. Some people eat late into the night. You need to take a look at why you eat and how you eat. I think one reason those, you know, those diets that give you like the packaged food that comes are highly prescriptive. One reason those are so successful is it's a new kind of autopilot, you know? You don't have to think. You just rip open the package and eat it. But sooner or later, you have to kind of go back into the real world and back to the cafeteria, and you haven't really changed that behavior. So when you think about it, come up with that personal thing. One of my favorite resolutions someone made was just to leave something on their plate. Just leave something on their plate. Even if you serve something a little bit more, just leave something on your plate. Because if you're used to finishing, which is an autopilot activity, finish all my food, and you train yourself to see something tasty disappearing with your plate, that will be a game changer. All of those can be really, really profound uh, changes. So we went through personal action, et cetera. Let's do uh, just a little bit more. OK, I guess the only other thing I want to say is you have to be relentless, single-minded purpose and relentless. You hone in on this narrow behavioral change and you just hammer it. You hammer it and hammer it until after a while it doesn't feel weird. It might not feel natural for a few weeks. At about four to six weeks, it won't cost you so much to maintain it. And then you can go on to other micro-resolutions, just two at a time, because you really, you can try to do them all, but you will fail. It, it's a lot of focus. And the thing is, you want to preserve most of your focus for these other things you're doing at work. So just two at a time and single-minded purpose. Um, the rest of the book is devoted to sort of different chapters on, and there's chapters on cueing and how you cue a resolution. There's chapters on how you frame a resolution so you want to do it. The cue is important. You want to be explicit about it. We did talk about sort of schedule cues, like doing things on a day. But if it's a relationship cue, for example, or something like that, you have to isolate um, the moment that tells you, OK, this is, this is my new behavior, right? So if your behavior in a relationship that you're trying to change is not to say, I told you so to your partner, you might not think that's big change. But I can guarantee you it will improve your relationship tremendously if you don't say, I told you so. <laughs> when you feel the impulse to say, I told you so, that's the cue to not say, I told you so, right? <laughs> if you have trouble when you receive feedback at work, uh, what we call feedback, it used to be called criticism, now is developmental feedback. When you receive developmental feedback, you could re receive it from a colleague or a subordinate or your boss. If you try to solve for all those cues, you're going to short circuit. So I would say pick one. Um, if you have subordinates who want to be able to give you feedback and tell you that you're wrong, I would say, you know, that's a great thing for a leader to feel OK about being told you're wrong. You might practice a response. When your response, when you feel yourself wanting to say, oh, well, the reason I did that or whatever, you might train yourself to say, thank you. I really appreciate you giving me that feedback. You don't have to say you agree with it. you know. But these kind of things disrupt those cues between people um, and give you a chance to respond in a different way. And there are a lot of them in the book. I'll do one more, which I think is really significant for the workplace. There's a story of one person in the book who didn't get promoted because she was told she, she was a bit negative and that thought that she would have to develop sort of a more positive uh, sort of uh, attitude you know, in the workplace before she had a leadership position. Uh, her first sort of response was how unfair it was. But she had heard it before. And she decided to make a resolution. This person was a complainer. She decided to make a resolution not to be the first to complain in the workplace. Not never to complain, but not to be the first to complain. And the very first day of her resolution, something happened in the workplace that she thought was worthy of complaint. And she sort of waited for someone else to take the lead, and no one said anything. And in that moment, she realized it was her. I mean, she really was the person. It seemed like a group thing, because everybody joined in. But she was really the one that started it. So 
a lot of subtle things can make a huge change um, and uh, that's really partly what the book is really what the book is about one more thing and then I'd love to do questions um, sleep uh, is your friend in self-improvement sleep restores your willpower stores it restores yourself it rebalances hormones uh, that have to do with hap appetite and being satiated that help you if you diet. If you don't get at least six hours, those hormones don't come into balance and you feel hungrier and what you eat satisfies you less. Um, people spend hundreds of dollars on creams to make them look more youthful. If you get more sleep, you'll look more youthful. Uh, all the studies show that you know for anything physical, you'll sink more baskets, you'll get more first serves in, you'll do flip turns in the pool faster if you sleep more. Sleep load if you have something big to do. It's really hard if you're a programmer, but there's a lot of things that you can do. If you get on the computer late at night just to check your email, you're likely going to be on for two hours. That's something you can do. But it, really taking a look at sleep and making sure you get more of it is important. Um, anyway, that's sort of the basic outlines of the book and why it works for me. Uh, I've lost 22 pounds. I'm the fittest I've ever been. I'm the most organized and the neatest I've ever been. I've improved relationships. I'm not perfect in any of these things. Um, Ralph Waldo Emerson called it the endless work of self-improvement. But doing one thing differently, proving to yourself you can learn to do one thing differently really punches your ticket for the voyage of continuous self-improvement. Once you kind of get that hit, hey, I changed myself, right? Uh, it's just a question of deciding where you want to go that day. So that's that. So any questions? Yes? Do you believe there are aspects of personalities don't change? So I believe aspects of personalities don't change. Um, I believe personality traits are tenacious, but I think things give way to doing differently. So being different is one thing, but if you learn to behave differently and you can train yourself in that example, not to say I told you so, you will definitely change your personality. You may feel very liberated not to feel that you have to say I told you so. But in that case, you're mm. changing how other people are going to perceive you. You are not, and, and it is possible that other people now perceive you differently and they, and they might believe that you have become a better person, but you may still not be in agreement with yourself, which would be a cause of... Uh, okay, so that's a, that's a great point. Um, so let me make two points about that. One of these I did for myself was, um, I would come home, I have worked all day, I made dinner for my family, and then my husband would say something like, Hey, you know, you left the light on in the basement, right? <laughs> and I'd feel this surge of resentment, but I would say, oh, I'm sorry. And then I would explain why it was, which was really my long litany of everything I had done all day that he should have appreciated, right? And there'd be such a sour feeling in the, in the air after that. And one day I decided, what would happen if I just didn't apologize, if I just said, oh, got it, you know? <laughs> and I started doing that. And I felt so much better, you know? Like I didn't feel like I had abased myself by apologizing when I didn't mean it. It became a micro-resolution not to apologize when I didn't really mean it. You know, is a gotcha. Uh, I, I treated everything he said as if it were a gotcha. You know, is a gotcha, if a gotcha doesn't get you, is it still a gotcha? You know, no. It's just information. And I felt lighter. I felt better. I enjoyed life more. You change by doing things differently, not just by telling yourself that you must change. And it's really profound to do that. And, and you know, I have a lot of these things with my child and elsewhere. One thing I didn't mention that was important is a micro resolution has an intrinsic value. It's not a someday thing. That's one of the things that's a problem with New Year's resolutions. It's kind of like if I do all these things, someday I'll be neat. If I do all these things, someday I'll be organized. I don't even think of these things as steps. You know, a step implies the reward is in the future. It is what it is. If you teach yourself to make your bed, that's what you get. You get a made bed. If you teach yourself not to eat half a candy bar in the afternoon, that's what you're going to get. You don't eat half a candy bar in the afternoon. You make your bed, whatever it is. It's like an intrinsic value. And there's no such thing as a small change. All of them carry benefits. Change is good, somebody said, and it is. Um, any other questions? Yes. How do you recommend getting past like 
catastrophic failures in your plan? Like, what if you lost your red notebook on an airplane and you never found it again? All of a sudden, all of your notes are gone. Okay, so if I something like that happened, I'd go get another notebook and just chalk it up to experience. But you do raise a good point. Sometimes they don't work. So one of the tenets of the book is, hey, they should always succeed. If it's reasonable and limited and in your power to do, you should be able to succeed. But the book does talk about test driving your resolution because it does take a couple weeks to sort of feel, do you have it right? And it's you said to yourself, I'm going to walk twice a week, and it turns out to be too hard, scale it back to what you can do. If you say you're going to walk a mile, and it turns out to take too long, walk half a mile. And if it seems like a cop out, it isn't, because what you're looking for is a behavior that's repeatable forever. It's a forever thing. So if it takes, I mean, I'm not saying that sometime in your life you might decide you're going to stop walking to work, of course, but you're trying to do something and routinize it so you can do it forever. So getting it right and getting it to fit uh, is important. So don't be afraid to make adjustments during the first couple of weeks. Yes? So one of the things that you talked about was sleep and yeah. um, New Year's resolutions. And you also brought up framing and how we can frame things differently. I'd be really curious to hear your thoughts on, okay, so I know that me, I definitely need to get more sleep and every day tell myself, oh yeah, I'm going to get home by 9 so I can be in bed by 9.30 so I can be sleep Of course, I'm going to Right. So, in terms of framing, what would you suggest? Um, well, the first thing I think is to find out why it is you stay up late um, and what keeps you up. And then I'll talk a little bit about framing. So if you find yourself eating late at night, but you're not really hungry, you're trying to stay awake. So sugar is, or something sweet, when people say they have the munchies and they ate dinner two hours ago, they're really trying to stay up. Um, so one thing, one resolution might be, and it's in the book somebody made, not to eat, uh, to stay awake, let's say. Uh, another thing uh, is, you know, I ended up getting about seven hours more sleep per week by uh, breaking up this habit. I would put my kid to sleep and then I'd rush downstairs to kind of hang out with my husband, which usually meant watching TV, and then I'd fall asleep on the couch for a couple of hours and I was too tired to get up and get ready for bed. I just could not face, like, contacts, flossing, phone charging pajamas, so I just kept sleeping. And then finally I get myself up and I do all those things and then I'd be wide awake and couldn't sleep because I'd had my nap. So one simple thing I did was I just got ready for bed before I ever went downstairs. And as soon as I felt dozy, I got up and just slipped between the sheets. There was nothing left to do. To your point about framing, to these changes that I made, I also sent myself the message, I'm just, when I was tempted to stay up, I'm more successful when I get more sleep. I'm more successful when I get more sleep, like a mantra. Um, framing is a great topic. I once made the micro resolution. One of the most important ones I ever made was to eat more slowly. I ate really fast. I was the first done. Then I would eat bread out of the basket or go get other food because everybody else was still eating. <laughs> and I told myself to chew my food slowly. Yuck. What a horrible resolution, to chew your food slowly. So I reframed that to, to dine leisurely and savor my food and drink. Who wouldn't want to do that? Dine leisurely and savor my food and drink. And while I was dining leisurely and savoring my food and drink, this little voice would say to me, if you don't speed up, you'll never finish all this food. It came to me again and again. It was not an accident. I didn't, I never knew until I sort of isolated that channel that I had in my head the notion I had to hurry up and finish and get done. It's yet another accomplishment in my day to finish all my food. And I realized kind of in that moment, uh, I rushed in everything I do. You know, I rushed uh, whether it was the weekend if somebody's walking slowly in front of me and I really don't have any place to go, I resent that person. And that was kind of a revelation. One thing when you really isolate and get down to these precise targets, you're listening on a channel that's so clear you can really hear what it is psychologically to the point this gentleman made that's in your way. I don't know if I answered your question entirely about framing and sleep. Yeah, I think that was a good mantra. Okay. But yours will be personal. Yes, Amy. We have an online question. Okay. I live with a two-year-old who sleeps with my wife and I. Uh -huh. uh, we'd like to get our daughter to sleep in her own bed. What would be a micro-resolution to work on that? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Well, I mean, I don't know a lot about what that bedtime routine is like. 
Um, it could be that uh, if now you just put the child in bed with you and that's the routine, you could maybe have the bed and go spend a certain amount of time with your child. You could say that let's, you know, that you're going to move your child after a certain amount of time, pick up when you're asleep and tell them how much better that's going to be. Um, you know, uh, training a child um, and making a shift like that uh, is a little different from changing your own behavior, but trying to understand what, what your child gets out of that arrangement might help you uh, come up with something there. Uh, something with my child, for example, a little different, again, my own behavior, not my child's behavior, is when she became a teenager, we started to have like kind of a lot of yelling and standoffs. And one day I just made the resolution not to try to top her with my voice, but to lower my voice. And every time she raised her voice, I lowered my voice. And then she would prick up her ears. You know, she, she had to lean in to kind of listen. And um, it didn't always carry the day. I can't say that I've never blown it. But mostly, it helped a lot. Um, so kind of understanding her psychology a little bit and her desire to fight. Same thing with a child who wants to sleep. Of course, it's about security. So what are different sort of security uh, substitutions you can make bit by bit that ultimately make your child, you know, confident enough to sleep on their own. Yes. You mentioned it takes about four to six weeks to kick that micro resolution into autopilot. And did you also say you would never get more than two at any one time? Two at a time. So I want to be clear, it won't be completely autopilot after four to six weeks, but it won't bug you so much. It'll be more natural. It'll be kind of, doesn't take a lot of willpower at that point. Over a period of weeks, it moves itself into autopilot. Two at a time is plenty. If, you, if, they, if they average five a week, that's 20 changes to your behavior you can make this year. That's profound. You know what the tenant of behavioral science is by Townsend and Beaver, two behavioral science, scientists? This is the tenant. Most of the time, what we do is what we do most of the time. Every once in a while, we do something new every once in a while. Doing something new is a big deal. So if you do 20 things new this year, it'll be immensely empowering. I mean, actually changing your behavior and seeing it go into the place where you never want it to change back again is empowering. It's also identity changing because all the preferences that you have and the attitudes and the values line up with the way you behave. When you shift your behavior, some of those preferences hang around for a while, but sooner or later, they realign to your new behavior and you feel like a different person. You have a new identity. If you describe yourself, you know, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a, such a hopeless slob, you know. At a certain point, you don't feel like a hopeless slob anymore because you've done these things. You haven't become, you know, and your preferences start to be for order, you know, uh, because you've trained yourself to appreciate order in one area. It starts to spread. That's like a cornerstone. But two at a time. Beyond that, you're just going to short circuit yourself. Don't be impatient. That's why New Year's resolutions fail. Impatience. Yes? Uh, you have a micro resolution. You achieve it. You move on to some other resolution. Right. And your first resolution has now gone for a toss. So what do you do? It now goes bad? Yes. Well, it, can happen. it shouldn't happen. If it does happen, you have to go back you know, and keep going. You shouldn't ever move on to a new one. Four weeks is sort of a standard, but if it feels really wobbly and like it needs a lot of support, don't move on to anything else until it's ingrained. Yes? Um, I, I guess my main question is about planning. Like this is something that when I tell myself, I'm like, I'm going to do things once a week or something. And then it, everyone, you know, I've heard it over and over again, schedule at an exact time and a place mm. that you're going to go. Mm. But then with schedules that change and travel mm. and all of that, how would you suggest, you know, because then I'm like, well, I said I would do this Mondays, but this Monday, the next three mm. Mondays, I'm out of town. Mm. And then it disappears. OK. So I mean, I think that's a very common thing. Schedule thing can change. You're looking for the best time that you're most likely to be able to do this thing. So if you think about travel or three-day weekends or personal things you might not do on a Monday, you're going to skip. If you have a, something that's scheduled, there's going to be times that you skip it. But if you do it most of the time, it, you know, it will succeed. And it, I wouldn't say, like if you missed a Monday, I wouldn't say don't go Tuesday. You probably will want to go Tuesday. I only say only measure yourself on Monday because you want to get the day that's the best that you can maintain. 
If you say, okay, Tuesday's as good as Monday, Wednesday's as good as Monday, uh, tomorrow's as good as today, if any day is as good as today, you'll get to the weekend and you won't even know what happened. Why did I not go? Because no day is good. No day is good for a change in behavior. <laughs> What's good is to do everything the same way all the time. So yeah, I mean, look, uh, I had like a, a thing of paying bills on Monday nights because my husband had a class and he came home and the thing was I would just go straight and go through all my paperwork and do it. And then he gave up that class and the thing went away. And for months I had like, I, I couldn't get on top of it. I had to come up with another time that was good. So things do shift around. Um, and so, you know, you have to kind of be flexible in that way. But if you're completely flexible and you're always a good reason for not doing it, you won't, you want to get it to the habit space, right? Um, one thing about going to the gym, I think like a lot of us want to go to the gym. We want to be fitter, but we don't really imagine all that business of you're tired after you go to work, you get out onto the floor, you exercise, and then you have to get back into your tired work clothes again and go home. The whole thing, you know, it, 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 it's, it's a lot of pieces that are uncomfortable. You know, in the book, one person goes to the gym for 15 minutes, 15 minutes to row, that's it. But what is canny about that resolution is it's going to the gym and doing all those steps and leaving that gets you the habit not whether or not you spend 15 minutes or an hour. It's like figuring out what is the gym near you, what's the right time to go. And if you say, I'm just going to go for 15 minutes, you say, well, that's not going to do anything. Yeah, it'll do something. It'll neurologically embed that feeling of going to the gym and doing all those steps. Somebody else? Yes. So writing a book is a pretty big project, but it's also not necessarily open to behavior change. Do you form micro resolutions to get to write regularly? Yes, so I, I actually did. I have to be honest and say, once I had a contract, I did take some time off work. But I did go back to work and had to keep writing. And I get up an hour earlier to write on uh, weekdays. So I have sort of adjusted my sleep so that I can get up. It's my best hour for writing. Um, and at first, it wasn't an hour. At first, it was really just 20 minutes, just to get 20 minutes in. And I sort of successfully moved that back for me. But I love getting up early and writing now. And I'd always been kind of a late morning person. So it just goes to show you. Yes. One more. So obviously some micro-resolutions are harder than others. Yes. Like I personally have one that's flossing every night, and I'm yes. doing it, and that's great, but it's pretty easy, right? Yes. Another one I would have is like listen well, yes. um, and which has a lot behind it and as far as uh, not thinking of other things when people are talking to you, important people in your life. How do you break those things down to make that like a micro-resolution? Okay, that's, that's a great good. question. Well, what is listening well to you? Give me a characteristic of it. Is it... Well, it's giving, it's sympathetic, it's... Maybe not interrupting? Yeah, um, more, more for me it's about um, not, I'm already thinking about other things and I'm not okay, thinking yeah. what you're saying. <laughs> okay, this is what I would say. <laughs> you're not going to listen well all the time. If your head is in that space, so pick a time where it's really important to listen well. It could be when your kid comes home from school and your first interaction with them, you tell yourself, I'm going to give my kid my attention. I'm not going to go to the phone. I'm not going to do it. And you'll practice it in a limited space. It could be, you know, when my partner tells me about this special project that they're doing that bores the tears out of me. <laughs> I'm going to pay special attention and I'm going to ask a question. Okay, it could be as simple as that. I'm going to be pay attention when I hear about this project. I'm going to ask a question. There's a story of somebody in the book who uh, had a regular job and their husband had a creative job and his creative job allowed him to stay up late and work in front of the TV and stuff and always wanted to tell her about the movie he had seen the night before. And she hated it. It was like, oh my God. And it was a movie she'd seen. And she felt some resentment that she had to go get up at six and he stayed up till three. And one day she just, and she kept signaling him that she didn't like it. She said that she was so antsy, she couldn't even sit still. She never looked at him, all these kind of things. And then one day she decided, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to give, him my entire attention when he tells me about the movie. And she never really got interested in the movies, but she did give, and she asked questions, and she said the goodwill that was created between them was enormous. She couldn't believe it. You know, when she stopped just fighting, like, oh God, oh my God, here it comes. Like, it's going to tell me about Nashville, you know? She just listened to it. So I think if you pick a specific instance where it really counts, and practice there, it'll bleed into other areas. It's a, it, you know, it's a skill to listen well. Yes? 
Is there any science behind the, the frequency of the habits you're trying to establish? Because I seem to have success with daily things. Change. I say weekly or a few times a week, like uh, uh. every two weeks. The further apart they are, the harder to forget, or yeah. it's harder to predict. Yeah, um, there's a lot in the science of cueing. So in a certain way, and, and to the point um, this, young, this woman made over here about, you know, what about Monday or whatever. Yeah, the things that I have that are once a month things, I have to cue myself. So if it's like I'm going to review, uh, you know, I have one thing where I review bills, not to see if they're accurate, but to see if there's any way to save money. You know, I actually have something in my calendar that tells me the day is coming up a couple of times to remember so that I do it. It is easier to do it daily. Um, I think catching cues is a very, uh, you know, for things, schedule, scheduling can be difficult if it's just once a month or whatever, but on the other hand, it's very concrete. These kind of cues between people, you know, where you want not to be defensive or not to complain or you want to remember to do something differently, you know, that requires kind of isolating something in the environment to cue you. And you're responding to cues all the time. You know, if somebody brings donuts, that's a cue. They bring pizza, that's a cue. You go to the store and they've put out samples. You're being, the environment is serving up cues all the time. So if you say, well, I'm just never going to eat any food I didn't plan to eat, that's not going to work. But if you say, OK, I'm not doing donuts, you can do it. So kind of trying to find that one cue can be really uh, critical. Um, piggybacking on things, you know, with my notebook habit, I, I kept forgetting to take it out at the beginning of the meeting. And one reason it irritated me is I'd have to stop and find it. So I started saying, as soon as I slip off my bag, I take out my book. I slip off my bag, I take off my book. And I had never thought of slipping off my handbag as a habit or a behavior, but it is. You know, it's something I do all the time. I sit down, I slip off my handbag, take out the book. And so in that way, I was able to get a better flow with it. So. Um, I hope if you get the book, there's, there's some other things in there that might prove helpful. Anybody else? Thank you so much. Oh, thanks. You guys were great. Really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Good luck.